options, right? You know, one option would be slow down hiring, but we had a lot of business and we had a lot of customers who, who wanted to use our product. And so slow, slowing down didn't seem like a great option, right? Like that, that seemed bad for the business. Um, so um, we, I kind of just took it day by day and tried to make it work um, while obviously hiring for the manager roles and, and director roles that I ultimately needed to make that more sustainable. So I think, um, I think it's easy to complain in any role. And that's probably one of my biggest general pieces of advice or things that I've learned is uh, nobody wants to hear complaining. Like if, if you do see problems, try to be constructive and come up with solutions to them. I love it. Yeah. Um, and then I was stupid and forgot to hit the record button. So just for the sure. people who came in late and also for the recording sake, Sanjay, thank you for being here. Senior Director of Engineering at Acasa. You've seen the company grow uh, 10 or 100x in the time that you've been there. So um, tons of good insight. And actually, what you mentioned about um, you got to a point where like your top priority was really about hiring and retaining really good people to keep up with the demand at the company. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the people on the call right now are part of the course I'm teaching about going from senior engineer to staff engineer. And so I talk a lot, and in general, in Taro, we talk a lot about what are the different behaviors that you expect as a senior engineering leader when it comes from mid-level to senior, senior to staff. So I wonder if you have a framework or a way you say, hey, this is an engineer, here's like the rough heuristic I use to figure out where are they on that ladder of being an individual contributor. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to talk through that, at least broadly. Um, I think I'll start at sort of new grad right out of college, just to try to be comprehensive with it. Um, you know, with, with a new grad, usually it's about building technical skills and proficiencies, right? So it's, um, you know, in college or boot camp or whatever the background is, um, in theory, you learn, um, you know, computer science, but in practice, once you get into the job, you realize there's a whole bunch of skills, like how to take things to production that you didn't learn anything about. and so you know, that first year or whatever that period is, um, people are going to be pretty hands-on, uh, give you a lot of help specking out the work that you need to do, um, teaching you the tools that you need to need to use. And a big part of that phase is can you quickly absorb all the skills that you need um, so that, you know, after someone showed it to you once or twice, that's that's part of your toolkit, right? And then then you can move to the next tool and, and the next one and, and keep acquiring new skills um, until you get to a point where you're self-sufficient, at least with the, with features that are sort of small to medium scope. Yeah. Um, Being a good student at that point. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, Mid-level folks um, at that point, what I start to look for is um, more of an eye for solving problems for the business um, identifying areas where we could use technology to, to do something better um, and, and starting to propose ideas like, hey, I think we could build a new software service or I think we can build a new feature here um, that, you know, that's going to help our customers or um, I see a big area of tech debt and I have some ideas about how we can improve them. So starting to take a broader lens not just somebody gives me a ticket and I do the ticket, but um, you know, really taking a, a bit of a broader lens, but usually still needing um, you know, some support or guidance or maybe mentorship is a better word um, on how to actually build it, right? Especially if it's, if it's something substantial. So you know, mid-level folks, um, let's say a project that might be a month or two months, um, I'd expect them to be able to execute on fairly independently. Um, but when, when we're getting to the larger initiatives, you know, touching multiple teams or, you know, exceeding three months um, in, in effort, um, it's uh, usually they don't quite have the tools um, to, to make that happen really efficiently and know how to stay on track and unblock themselves. But they're starting to build towards that. Mm. At, at the senior level, um, what I really look for is, uh, I would say, mastery of some part of the tech stack. You know, especially in a big company, it's not, not or even a, a medium-sized company, it's not reasonable for a senior engineer to know how everything works. 
um, but they should really be one of the go-to people for part of the tech stack. You know, somebody that uh, management can lean on to um, make good decisions about uh, what what we should do with that software, how we should build things, um, come with proposals. Uh, so a lot of times management will want to get something done, um, but they they uh, will lean on the people doing the work to figure out how to get it done. And that's, um, that's often what a senior engineer can help with. Um, and then I think a big thing at that role um, where things start to flip is that a big part of a senior engineer's job is to make everybody else better as well. So um, how can you raise the bar across the team or across the company, um, whether that's via you know code reviews or technical talks or mentoring other engineers on the team, um, basically starting to play some, some sort of leadership role. Um, and for staff, at least within a startup, uh, these are usually the people who, first of all, they have all, you know, they have all the technical tools they would need to take on, you know, any project or or various different types of projects, right? Not just one part of the tech stack, but but they have a really deep toolkit. Um, but they can also think pretty broadly about the business and evaluate more complicated trade-offs. Like, um, you know, now they can start to make recommendations about, is it worth taking on some tech debt to get this feature out quickly? Or is it going to be a total headache to maintain and should we just do it the right way and maybe the longer way first or um you know how should we prioritize work between two different initiatives that are competing for resources and and like how can we look for creative ways to get them both done so really at the staff level i look for somebody that not only has the technical tools but is also um making really good business decisions and and helping the company succeed yeah, like what's striking about that last uh, phrase you mentioned about like, okay, there are two different competing features. How do I decide between them? It You could have told me that was the expectation for like a manager or a product manager. And I'd go, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. But it sounds like the more senior you become, at least at a cost side in your experience, um, there is some element of like sharing responsibility beyond engineering when you get to that level. Is that right? Absolutely. I think that... Uh... Probably in any role, the more more senior you become, there's um, more of a leadership aspect. Whether or not you're a people manager is kind of irrelevant, but there's uh, there's an aspect of being a leader and help helping steer the direction that the company takes. And so, um, certainly at Acasa and at most other startups, I think um, staff level engineers are uh, you know are involved with pretty complicated decision making like that and and people lean on them heavily because they have um good instincts but also a, a wealth of technical knowledge that that can help inform the decision yeah that makes a lot of sense super helpful um and what i want to do actually though i'll ask one more question related to what we just talked about with leveling but then after that i want to make it a bit more interactive so i'll ask anyone here who's in the zoom if they have a question they can ask Sanjay directly and then I'll come back. I have a bank of questions so I can keep going, but I would love to get the audience involved. Um, so one thing I am curious about, which I put in the the just the Taro thread, Sanjay, is about when you joined Acasa, there was no concept, I imagine, of a senior engineer staff and you're like, you were, how, how, how big was the company when you joined? Sorry. A couple of people. A couple of people, yeah. So there's no, like, there's yeah. no leveling system when you have yeah. a couple of people, right? Um, and so that came later on. Uh, and so that actually happened before I joined Pinterest. And I remember actually, I wasn't there, but what I heard from the people who made that transition is that it was kind of difficult because someone thought that, oh, I'm operating at this level. And then someone came in and said, actually now we have a formal leveling system. You're gonna be put here and that'll dictate your equity refresh or your compensation bump or whatever. So this is more maybe a curiosity rather than like advice for the crowd. But I'm just kind of really genuinely curious. How did you manage that? Or how did the company manage that as you went from no leveling system to in imposing that on everyone? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think we put it in about a year into the company. So fortunately we did it fairly early, you know, before we had like hundreds of employees, for example. Um, but there was some of this, um, you know, ambiguity that you're talking about. I think uh, both the good and bad thing about working at a startup is uh, especially when we were really small like that, 
the leveling system just didn't matter that much. Um, and I think that can actually be really refreshing to some people who may come from a from a big tech environment where there's these really rigid levels and you have to spend a certain number of years at each level. Um, I think in Acasa still now, but even more in the early days, it was just all about performance and impact, right? So no one really cared um, how much experience you had or anything like that. It was, it was like, what what are you actually doing and contributing to the company? Um, in terms of, uh, so yeah, how did we uh, kind of retrofit our existing engineers into this leveling system? Um, it uh, basically what happened was uh, two of the founders and I, I think just sort of went through um, a lot of the engineers um, and, and we picked the, I'd say fairly standard leveling guide, at least for startups um, and, and kind of made some decisions uh, nothing, we were fortunate, which was, uh, nothing was too controversial. Um, and our team was still fairly small, maybe, maybe 10 engineers or so. So, um, so we hadn't gotten to the point where, um, we had to do this for tons of people. Uh, but I've definitely seen that be the case at other startups, especially early on, they'll, um, they might give a lot of people like a head of role you know, head of infrastructure or uh, head of engineering or whatever it might be. And then a couple of years later, when they decide to put a, a leveling guide in, um, you know, there's a lot of misalignment about yeah. what head of means. You know, does it mean a manager? Does it mean a director? Does it mean a VP? Um, so I have seen companies go through that. And I think the uh, the truth is, that, like, if if I were to do it again, I think when you're a small startup, you got to focus on the product um, and you, you have to do, you have to spend enough time on some of this other stuff to not dig yourself into a huge hole. But, you know, we could have spent hours and hours working on the best leveling guide ever, but ultimately that's not going to make our customers happy. And so there's a, a little bit of acceptance there that it's okay to, um, you know, to do something that might not be fully complete. Totally. Um, and yeah, that's actually very shockingly early for me from like 10 people. Like you, you guys did it super early, which I, 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 that probably will quell a lot of the concern that would happen. Like Pinterest, I think they did it when they were like 300 people. And so, yeah, at that point you probably have a lot of kind of layers and bureaucracy built in. Are, are levels at a cost of public? They are. Uh, uh, yes, they are. Sorry. I misunderstood your question at first, but yeah, both the leveling guide as well as as people's levels are public. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, the reason I bring that up is to your point earlier about how at big tech, that can actually become a barrier to you getting stuff done. Um, like at Google, levels are public. Like I can look, if I'm a Google employee, I can go into MoMA, which is their internal tool and say, hey, what level is Sanjay or what level is other person? And oftentimes what I've heard from people who work there is that they will make very quick judgments about your ability to contribute to a project Mm. Uh, based off of, hey, you're like an L4. I don't want to work with you. You're not going to be able to write a good peer feedback for my performance cycle. Let me go find a staff engineer or someone else who will actually be able to, to contribute more or help me out, right? Um, and so at Meta, which is my most recent company, all the levels were private. And that's actually a really interesting dynamic because you can still kind of tell, right? And I'm sure this is true uh, in your experience too, right? Sanjay was like, even though it's not like, labeled on your forehead, you can kind of tell based off of who people are talking to and yeah. who answers questions, what is the seniority breakdown of uh, of a company? So I thought that was kind of interesting, like the impact of having public levels or not. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, that type of politics is obviously destructive for any for any organization. You know, once people start to get concerned primarily about their level and their performance review, um, Clearly, that's eating away at productivity and also just at the at the working experience for people. Um, you know, maybe maybe companies uh, in big tech can afford it uh, to some extent, but certainly at a startup, there's no there's no time for that stuff. Um, yeah. And I think that's one thing I've uh, you know, if we if any people have questions about hiring, that's one thing I've had to be. Uh, pretty careful about screening for in the hiring process is making sure that uh, we're hiring people who want to be at a startup and do don't want to play sort of big company games in that sense. Yeah. 
that's actually a good segue. I mean, um, whether about hiring or some other topic, I would love for someone other than me to ask a question. Um, there's a couple that we have in the thread, but I wonder if anyone wants to just unmute right now and ask it. I had a question. Uh, thanks, NJ, for your time. Uh, I was curious if you know you can shed uh, light on um, what would be some of the key differences uh, when it comes to uh, these promotions uh, between a startup and big tech. Yeah, absolutely. I should. Uh, I'm happy to share my opinion. I should also say up front. I'm I'm like a total startup person. So I've always worked at uh, startups or fairly small companies. Um, I've, I've never actually worked in big tech myself. Um, and so it, it may be hard for me to sort of compare and contrast with that part, but I can at least share uh, the startup part. I think in a startup, really, it's just all about all about the impact you create for the company and nothing else matters, you know, uh, and and I think that that's a really good thing and really refreshing. You know, um, if you're someone who who does great work, it means that uh, you don't have to play politics or write a 20 page performance review or, you know, convince a committee of people to promote you. Um, good work will be recognized. And uh, certainly the way we've tried to uh, create the culture at Akasa is that people who help make the company successful will also be successful in their careers. Like we, we will make sure to recognize and reward hard work um, and, and specifically like impact. I think that the flip side of that is that... Um, Effort is not necessarily rewarded if it doesn't lead to impact. I think that's like a really important thing to understand is uh, there can be people who maybe are working really hard on something, um, but they ultimately don't finish the job, right? You know, they don't, they don't take the project over the finish line um, or they choose not to work on the right projects or whatever it might be. Um, and I think at a startup, it's probably a lot harder to advance. No one really advances just by default, you know, just by years of experience or anything like that. So, so it's sort of harder to advance um, if, um, if you're just coasting or not actually creating impact. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or if you have any follow-up questions, let me know. No, that makes sense. I think uh, the key takeaway for me is... Uh um your impact um like your what you've done is 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 more um compared to a big tech uh is seen more closely i guess um because you're having a wider impact uh in the smaller space yeah exactly and i think you have to do a lot less at a startup to advertise and self promote um just just candidly i think uh, people notice uh, who does good work and people are always, uh, you know, thinking, hey, how can I, how can I get that person involved in this new project? Because they, they totally crushed it on the previous thing they did, right? So there's just a lot of built-in recognition there, just out of resourcefulness, which is like startups are always resource strapped and we're looking for ways to get things done. So I think there's a, a, probably a lot less as uh, uh, promote self promotion and advertising needed, um, but then just a much bigger focus on on uh, the value that someone creates for the company. That makes sense. Thank you. And then before we go to Raghu's question, actually, I was maybe we can ping pong back and forth between the thread. The second most uploaded question was from Devin on the thread, Sanjay, and it goes back to this idea of hyper growth or the company expanding. Um, as each layer of hierarchy adds a level of of abstraction, how do you maintain the core founding mission, right? So you're no longer an individual contributor. I imagine you don't write very much code anymore at all, right? So both personally for you as a senior director and maybe as a company, uh, I'm curious if there are any things you've done to maintain the, the mission-oriented nature of startup. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, first thing I'll say is um, to the extent possible, 
it can be nice to avoid adding unnecessary layers of hierarchy. So that's that's one thing that people should think about is um, how many layers of hierarchy do you actually need? Uh, we are still, I'd say, fairly flat. Um, you know, so I report uh, directly to a co-founder of the company, um, and then managers and directors report to me, um, and individual contributors report to them. So I guess, like, you know, from individual contributors, it's sort of uh, three hops to to a co-founder of the company, which I think is reasonable um, at this stage. How do you maintain the core founding mission? It's a great question. You know, when you're a 10-person startup, um, you don't have to uh, think about any of this stuff, like how do we how do we disseminate the priorities and how do we, um, you know, make sure people know what each other are working on and keep people in the loop and ensure consistency between, you know, different engineers in terms of tech stack, like, when you're that small, everybody knows everything that's happening at the company. And so you can take a lot of that stuff for granted. Um, I think as the company grows, and I also think to some extent this is exacerbated by uh, remote work where you lose a lot of the, you know, uh, water cooler interactions, you have, to, you have to put a lot more effort into communicating the strategy and the mission and the priorities. And so that's something we put a fair amount of effort into right now. Um, one thing we do that's been pretty successful is like a, a quarterly roadmap process that says like, you know, here are the things. It's something I, I work on a lot, um, but it's like, here's the things from a technology perspective that the company really wants to achieve um, in the next quarter. You know, mm -hmm. exactly how we achieve them, who's going to do it. That's not all covered in that document. But it's like, you know, I've talked with the CEO, the CTO, like all, all the management of the company. And here's where the company wants to be from a technology perspective in a few months. And then um, then you take that to the teams and obviously get feedback and get some back and forth. And um, so I think, you know, the long and short of it is as the company grows, you just have to work a lot harder um, to really communicate the mission and the priorities and don't assume that people know it because uh, if people aren't talking to each other every day, then um, then they're not going to know what's going on. That's super helpful. Thanks. All right. Raghu, do you want to go unmute and ask? Yeah, sure. Hey, Sanjay, how are you? Hey, good. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. So well, my question to you is, uh, <clears throat> especially for people as, uh, who join at like senior levels, like, you know, mid senior to staff, senior staff, either in an IC role or in a management role. Um, one kind of one written rule is how best and how quickly can they create influence at a new place? So, which I think would also boil down to how uh, how can they build relationships at a new uh, niche, a new team very fast? So my question is, when we are at a new place, uh, when we're trying to build relationships, how how can someone guard is whether this member is going to be a supporter or if this, if this person is going to be someone who's your so is there i mean how, how how can you kind of send yeah sorry it got a little jumbled um but just to just to make sure i got it i um i think the parts i got were uh when you join a new company um you know you want to start creating an impact and part of that comes from developing relationships and and how do you figure out um which team members are going to be supportive and which ones aren't? Was that was that kind of the idea? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it's a good uh, it's a good question. I think uh, I can only speak from my experience, and so my advice may be a little bit backwards um, from from most others. But I think what I've seen of uh, 
the best way to gain respect and you know ultimately influence and all of that is just to do a great job on whatever you're given however small or boring it might seem even at the beginning um so uh a common pattern i've seen is like you know somebody comes into a new role um they're a little bit unproven and so sometimes they'll be given work that's kind of lower priority or a little bit less interesting um and you know right away they they start you know uh you know demanding more interesting work or you know asking to be part of stuff that has a much bigger scope um it's kind of like the the best way to prove yourself is just just to knock it out of the park at whatever you're given um and and as i said most people will notice that certainly that's happened several times at Acasa where, you know, I onboard all of the engineers basically the same way. Um, but then, you know, some of them just like totally stand out in terms of how, how they went through that phase um, and how much value they created, how quickly they did it, how independently. Um, and so, and then I think once you start to have that reputation as somebody who gets things done, um, in my opinion, everybody's more likely to turn into a supporter because they want to be associated with people who can get stuff done and who are going to be, you know, a net net positive to any project that they work on. Um, so, so that's kind of my advice. It's it's um, take it with a grain of salt. You know, it's it's probably a little backwards from like. Um, you know, what a lot of management books or, or other types of things might say. Um, but that's my honest advice is like, um, just become known as someone who's going to do a great job. And suddenly a lot more people turn into supporters because they, they want to work with you and, and, and they want to do a great job too. Thank you. That's uh, very insightful. Appreciate it. Yeah. I'm looking back at the, uh, the tarot thread. I think Casey has a bunch of really good questions and I think she's actually on the call. So Casey, if you are able to unmute and you want to ask a question, would love for you to do that. She is on the call. Um, I guess going in order, I was wondering if you can share a bit about um, when and why you transitioned into, into management. Like, was that always your goal or was that kind of based on the need of the company at the time? Yeah, and good you have question. Skill set to kind of fill that need. Yeah, good question. So when and why? So when probably about four years ago. Um, so I think I'd been at the company for uh, several months as an individual contributor. We were still really small. Uh, we started to get some traction and started hiring more engineers. And so I think it was clear that uh, somebody needed to step into that role, um, and it was just a problem I could help solve. Uh, was that always my goal? Um, not necessarily, you know, or or certainly um, like getting to my position right now was definitely not always my goal. I think I was interested in, in management and technical leadership, um, but really over the years, I've just tried to adapt myself to help wherever the company needs. You know, as we talked about earlier in the call, at times that meant I was interviewing and hiring all the time. I think there was one year when I interviewed like 200 candidates in a year, you know, at other times that meant I was heads down writing code or, or, you know, building technology um, and not doing much else. And so uh, I think to sum it up, there was a, there was a need from the company and it was a, a problem I thought I could help solve. And that's, that's kind of been the story of my career progression so far is just um, just trying to fill gaps and help where I can. Um, I could totally see myself like, you know, going back to even an individual contributor role or like, a, you know, a manager of a single team, more like a tech lead manager role in the future. And I'd be totally fine with that, too. Awesome. That makes sense, especially in a startup environment. That's kind of what the requirement is to fill the needs as the skills acquire. 
Um, the next question was kind of, in your opinion, when is it appropriate to transition into management, especially if one's goals and strengths kind of align with that career path? Uh, for example, one of the conversations we were having in the class that Rahul's doing from senior to staff is um, the difference between senior to EM versus staff to EM. So mm -hmm. is there a significant difference in transitioning from senior to EM or to staff to EM in your yeah, experience or from your perspective? Good question, for sure. Um, what I won't address is, or unless you want to, is like, uh, why should you or should you not want to transition to management? I think I answered that on one of the Tara forums somewhere else. I'm, I'm happy to talk through that if you're interested, but I'll sort of take it as a granted, as you said, that especially if one's goals and strengths align with this career path. I think that's really important. And and so uh, in my opinion, people shouldn't be transitioning into management if, if that latter part is not true. Um, you know, one thing I think about is um, uh, when you move into management, Early on, you can still do a fair amount of technical work. Um, and in my role right now, as Rahul pointed out, like it's it's very hard to find time to write code on a on a regular basis. Um, but even when you first transition over, it's obviously going to be less technical work than you were doing as an individual contributor. And so, if you're trying to make a career out of management. Uh, one way I like to think about it is building a strong technical foundation uh, so that you will have the skills to be a good manager, right? Um, well, cause I think especially to be a good manager, you need to be a good engineer, you need to be able to provide feedback on how to do something. And, um, and so I would say that, um, having the technical skills is really important. Um, in that sense, you know, should you do it from senior engineer or from staff? Uh, I think at the at the staff level, when you move over, um, you've really had the time to build like a very solid technical skills and you've probably started to be involved more in a lot more kind of leadership and, and product level decision making anyways. So I think you'll have a, frankly, a better idea of what it's going to look like um, and you, you'll just have more skills and, and a better reputation within the company to make that transition easy. Um, it's also totally possible to, to do it earlier, like transitioning from senior end to EM. Um, it can just be a lot of new skills to learn at once, right? It's like, um, you know, you have to learn how to manage and lead, um, but also you may have to hire a staff engineer on your team. And, you know, some people have some imposter syndrome if, if they're going to be managing a staff engineer or a principal engineer, but they've never been one themselves. And, and then they try to figure out like, okay, how can I add value to that person's career if they're a better engineer than me? And, you know, the secret is I actually think there's a lot of ways to do that successfully. Um, it's just that uh, you have to learn a lot of these skills sort of at the same time, if you move over to management uh, from being a senior engineer. Hopefully Can I do that makes sense. a quick uh, like addendum to that? It's a great, great question. Um, you mentioned, Sanjay, around the fact that like as a manager, you do need to have some technical underpinning or grounding because you might want to be able to give feedback. I'm curious, does that actually happen? Like how often in your day-to-day -day are you giving feedback on a design document or architecture saying, hey, I actually don't think this is correct. We need to think about this the other way. Or do you view that as a failure where like someone screwed up on the ice ladder that they're actually coming to you for a technical decision? It almost feels like a anti-pattern. I'm, I'm curious about how involved are you technically? Yeah, good question. Um, so I will say I try not to be involved in every little decision uh, because I don't want to I don't want to slow the team down. But anything big, I am very involved in. Um, and so anytime we're taking on like a large new project or we're going to build an, a brand new product um for example i'm super involved in that and a lot of it is uh it's not that i'm the brightest technical mind you know in the group in fact i think we have amazing engineers who are way better than me um but it's that i have a lot uh broader context into what the company's goals are um, and what's actually important for the company. Um, and I have 
enough of the technical skills and technical details to be able to figure out how to marry those two things together and create an approach that's going to be successful for the company. Um, you know, certainly as like a manager, let's say a manager of a single team, all the time you're going to be giving technical feedback, right? You're, it's going to be code reviews, uh, design discussions, you know, um, all of that type of stuff. And so I do think it's really important, but yeah, Rahul, to your point, it kind of changes depending on what level of management you're in. That makes sense. And then Casey, back to you, maybe we can combine the last two questions into one question just so we can move on to the other folks too. But do you want to do the last one? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the last two are kind of, what is the role of a director level in an engineering department? Um, and then within that, what expectations do you have of the people who report to you, like of their impact that they should be having on the organization or the team or department? And then similarly, what expectations are put on you from your higher ups? It sounds like the co-founder of what impact you should be having. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll obviously caveat this by saying uh, titles are very, uh, you know, subjective or variable depending on, on uh, you know, what company you work at, but I, I'm happy to share my experience. Um, I think a director role in our engineering department uh, should be able to own, you know, uh, a team or a set of teams that work on uh, basically like a, a related piece of initiative that's important for the company. So for me, um, for example, I, I started what was called the platform or get a casa. And the idea was we build all of the reusable software components that power all of our products. So um, in healthcare, you know, every hospital system can be a little bit different. So we don't directly do the work of like uh, go to market and configuring each of our products to, um, you know, be customized for each hospital system, but we build like basically all of the underlying technology um, that that enables it, right? And so, you know, as a director of that group, a uh, big part of my job was uh, first figuring out what we should work on. Um, it's not, not always super clear. So uh, heavy involvement with all of our stakeholders to figure out what they need and what's going to create value for the company. Um, second, figuring out how to structure and motivate the team uh, so that they can operate efficiently, right? You don't want um, the mythical man month problem where it's like adding a new person actually just creates a bunch of overhead and, you know, people are in meetings all day or trying to coordinate with each other. Um, so I think figuring out how to, how to structure the team and divide up work. Um, and then obviously making sure that things are operating at an excellent level, right? That, that people are moving fast, and doing great work and taking ownership for things. So that was a big part of what that was like um, at a, at, in, in my uh, time as a director. Um, and then, you know, I think that kind of flows into the second part of the question, which is what are the expectations we have? Um, I think for all of my managers and directors, the biggest thing is how can they be as productive as possible with the resources they have? Right. So like, you know, let's say you have five engineers on your team, you know, how much value can you create for the company? I think that's like the key question to ask. And then a hundred things, there's like a hundred inputs to that question, but that's ultimately the thing that we measure on, you know, the inputs to that are like, you know, do you, can you retain people, you know, do they like working with you? Do they take your direction? Do you give them clear priorities? So they're not wasting time working on random things. You know, do you supervise their work so that they, you know, they're doing it correctly? Um, do you give people the space to make decisions themselves when it's appropriate so that everything doesn't run through you and you're not slowing it all down? You know, I could go on and on and on. I know we don't have time, but I think the key question is like, um, how much value can you create for the company with, with the amount of resources that you have? And then is that, the, I guess, the same expectation of you? Then I guess that the co-founder is looking to you of how much value are you creating for the company as a senior director? Yeah, basically. I mean, I think it at my level, it's like, it's all about impact. So uh, what I said about individual contributors earlier, that, that matters even more at my level. 
doesn't matter how hard I try on something. It's like either I create an impact or I don't. Um, and then I think the other thing that's a big part of my job is um, sort of helping define the strategy um, and helping helping the company uh, figure out what we should work on. Thanks for uh, all the questions, Casey. That's super helpful, Casey. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, before we go to Adi Pratik, uh, uh, two things I do want to ask, but first we go to Adi is I want to talk, Sanjay, about two things that I think will be broadly interesting or helpful to many people, um, job market and hiring, like what do you look mm -hmm. for, and then remote work. So those we can hopefully do more rapid fire um, after this next question, but I just wanted to put that out there in case folks are interested in that. But okay, Adi, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Rahul. Uh, uh, hey, Sanjay, uh, nice to meet you, and thanks for your time, by the way. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, as a staff engineer, I'm always, I'm always, I'm, I mean, a part of me is always scared to move into management uh, with the fear that I might lose touch with uh, what's happening in the latest uh, technology, and uh, if I would become incompetent in future, uh, with respect to how well I can code and build systems on my own, which is what I've been doing till now. So uh, just adding on to what uh, you answered for Casey's question, uh, you said most of your role is uh, taking decisions that align with the company's uh, goals. Uh, how, do you find time to you know keep in touch with what's happening in the latest technology world? And if you do, how do you even find time to even understand that great question first thing i'd say is i think that fear is natural i i had that fear as well um and none of these decisions are permanent right so you can always you can always try management and after a couple of years if you don't like it um you can switch back right and so um i think some experimentation is available depending on the company you're in um and it's going to take, in my opinion, it's going to take more than a few years for the skills to atrophy. So, so if you did something else for a year or two, um, you're not going to totally lose your ability to code. Um, do I personally find time? I find a little bit, but not nearly as much as I would like to, right? I th think for me, um, the days are so busy that it's a lot of nights and weekends. Um, um, actually building stuff myself, often personal projects or sometimes really small things at work. Um, there's no way that I can do something on the critical path at work, like taking on a feature that has a deadline for a customer because I'm just going to hold people up. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm still super involved in all of the architecture and design um, decisions at, at the company. So I'd say any large technology decisions I'm heavily involved in, um, but day to day, Am I coding as much as I would like to? No, definitely not. Awesome, thanks. Uh, sorry, just one small uh, follow-up question. So when you say, when you are actually kind of making those design decisions and stuff, let's say a senior engineer proposes something new that's come up in LLMs that you, they want to in introduce into the product in the AI, and you are not yet aware of that new thing that, that's been um, released. So how do you handle that? Yeah, you got to learn it, right? I think that's a that's a, a big part of the job is um, being able to stay stay fresh. Because I think you're spot on on an assessment that somebody is going to become effective if they don't if they don't stay fresh with things that are happening in the industry. So I I for sure make enough time to um, kind of stay abreast of what's happening, but. Um, I don't get to build as many systems as I would like to these days. Um, but, but yeah, you got to, in my opinion, have some, I call it like a learning budget, but I don't even mean money. I mean time, time. right? You know, some, some amount of time uh, to stay close to the technology because that's going to make you long-term more effective. Got it. Cool. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, I'm curious, out of the people who are here, if you're actively looking for a job or you're open to job opportunities, can you give me like a thumbs up or some sort of reaction in Zoom just to get a sense of how many people are in that camp? I mean, I can tell you from Tar Sanjay, like from Taro, a lot of people unfortunately have been impacted by layoffs or they, they're just looking for a new or better job. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think this is a question about job searching and, and how you would think about that. So um, when you're hiring, right? 
what are, are there particular things that people can do to stand out and what recommendation would you have for people here who are actively on the job hunt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, of course, this is different at every company, but I think um, one thing I've learned over the years, initially I used to screen super hardcore for technical talent. Like I wanted to find like the the absolute best engineers we could find. Um, and sometimes that worked out really well, but other times it didn't. Um, and I think through learning from some of those experiences, I realized that, uh, you know, technical skills are table stakes. And so I'm going to assume that most people in Taro are, you know, preparing for technical interviews and that there's, there's not a ton I can do to help there. Um, but I started looking for a lot of other things as well. Uh, one thing I look for is great communication and collaboration. So I look for people who um, I could, you know, send them off to talk to a user or to a product manager or a stakeholder on a different team um, and, and feel like they are going to be able to effectively communicate what we're building and also effectively understand what, what folks are asking for. Um, and then a second thing that I think is really underrated is just hustle and ownership. You know, so I try to look for people who have uh, in some way gone above and beyond outside of the, um, you know, the, the scope or the, the box that their, that their role was in. So um, how did they, uh, you know, proactively find a way to, to make their team or their company better? Um, and, and are they interested in taking that level of ownership and just really making the company succeed. Um, so I'd say those are a couple of things that I've started to look for um, uh, kind of over the years. Um, and I think that it's a really tough job market right now, to be honest. And um, most people who are hiring uh, probably want folks who are flexible and just, you know, want to be part of a good company and want to help the company or the team succeed, even if um, it might change, you know, exactly what they work on or who they report to or, or that type of stuff. Yeah, that's really, really insightful. So it sounds like just saying it back to you, communication collaboration is one thing that you really look for when you're screening people. And the second thing is hustle. How does that manifest? Like what actionable advice would you have? Say, hey, I'm crafting my resume right now, or I'm trying to figure out what I can do in the next six months to make my profile look really good to someone like you. What would you tell those people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, part of it is, to be honest, how I craft my interview process where um, I don't want to give away all my secrets, but I'll give away one, which is I I, um, uh, I often do uh, basically a, a project presentation interview where the prompt is just, uh, tell me about a significant project that you've worked on and let's just, let's just talk about it for 45 minutes. Right. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a ton of questions, um, to try to see, uh, how much depth of thinking you had, um, and, and what parts you actually did, um, versus, um, what, you know, other people did or to what extent you were just doing what somebody else told you. Um, and then I think, especially for folks who have kind of gaps on their resume right now, I think it's always good to uh, build projects, um, you know, uh, write a blog post about some new piece of technology you're experimenting with, try to give a talk at a local meetup, you know, um, demonstrate your technical expertise and, and your communication skills, right, through both of those things in, in other ways, um, either... Uh, ideally by by building something that has users, but I know that can be hard and it can be a big time commitment. But as Rahul was pointing out in the chat, like even while I, I've had a job, I've written some technical blogs, I've given some talks at some of the regional PyCons and things like that. And that can be another good way to um, kind of showcase your knowledge and showcase that um, you're interested in learning and getting involved with things outside of your sort of regular job as well. Awesome. So um, I do want to ask maybe on an ending note about remote work, because I think there might be some nice spicy hot takes there. But before that, Sri had a really good question 
in the Taro q and I think Shri is on the call. So Shri, if you're able to unmute and you, you want to ask it, you can go ahead and do that. Otherwise, I can read it for you. Yeah, right on. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I was wondering, like, how does one assess uh, startup equity at the founding engineer level? Um, I mean, I work at a startup. It's been like four years, uh, almost like four and a half years, right? And it could take like multiple years to, let's say, to take a company to IPO, right? And I'm, I'm thinking like, does it become harder to leave if things don't work out in the long run? So like, yeah. let's say if I'm assessing joining an early stage startup at the, at like a, at, at a uh, like less, less than five member team, it's a really good question. I, I think you, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer. I can share my experience, but I, I think it's a tough part of startups right now. So, right, especially if you join at a early employee or founding engineer, um, to some extent, you, uh, you take many of the risks that founders take, um, but, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of the same uh, flexibility or upside, right? You know, most early employees, for example, don't get to participate in secondary rounds that founders might get to participate in. You know, most most early employees get common stock, not preferred stock, right? And so um, I think that this is sort of the flip side, to be honest, of being an early employee is that um, you, you take a lot of risk um, and you won't always see the upside there. Um, especially, uh, you know, these days when companies are staying private longer and longer. So as you said, you've been at your startup for four years and it might be several more years till you see a liquidity event. Right. Um, and I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, especially I, I think during the dot-com era, uh, companies were just going public a lot faster. So this, this problem, uh, did not exist to the same extent that it does now. Um, so I think it's challenging. I don't have a good answer. Uh, what I would say, uh, you know, what are the upsides? One is, you know, uh, joining as an early employee. Um, even if you don't get liquidity on your equity, you can get a lot of career growth. Um, that's certainly been part of my experience, right? And so uh, there's trade-offs there. Um, in terms of how quickly you're trying to make money and, and how quick, you know, at what times you're prioritizing career growth instead. Uh, so that I think is a meaningful trade-off. Like I, I don't think that my career would have grown this quickly had I joined a more established company where I would have gotten liquidity faster, right? So that's, that's one meaningful trade-off. Uh, to your question, like is leaving harder if things don't work out? Um, not necessarily, right? I mean, the best case is that your startup is doing awesome and your equity is worth a ton of money on paper, but you can't, um, you know, you, you can't sell it yet. In that case, you know, it's not a bad thing to to write it out or, or try to find a way to buy some of that equity if you do want to leave. Um, but at least that's a good outcome, right? Which is that you have you have the right to buy something that would be worth money and could make you money. Um, and, you know, if it's been four years and it's pretty clear that your startup's not on a great track or not going to work out, then there's nothing really binding you there either. So I think it's, it's totally up to you. And I agree, like, where you can get into a tricky situation is if you stay at a startup, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, without liquidity and without, um, you know, strong signs that the company is going to do really well. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thanks. Got a follow-up question for that. So um, the trends change. Now companies stay private longer. I, I worked at, uh, for a little, little bit of Bangor. I always worked at Big Tech, never been at startup, but let's say in future I have to consider uh, does something does this company staying private for longer longer time have now had any change in how uh, stocks get allocated for very early for engineers like within like for example in this case like less than five employees right do they what is the trend now are there any change in trend or is it like still the common stocks is what yeah uh, great question 
Um, and I think, uh, I think there have been some changes, but it's not uniform across the industry. So it sort of depends, uh, which, which school of thought your company falls into. Um, I don't think there's been major changes in terms of, you know, as a, as an early employee, I don't think you're going to get preferred stock very often, for example. Um, one of the big changes that some companies are starting to make, particularly, I think a lot of YC companies is um, that you can leave the company, but you have up to, I think, eight or 10 years to decide whether to purchase your stock options. <laughs> um, and that is a extremely meaningful change because it means that you're not, um, you don't have these, uh, you know, quote unquote, golden handcuffs uh, tying you at the company. Like you don't have to um, decide within 30 days or 90 days whether to spend possibly thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to exercise your equity, but you don't even know if it's going to be worth anything. So I think extending that exercise window, like many companies have done, and I think YC recommends that these days, I think that gives uh, significantly more optionality to employees. It's a very employee-friendly thing, in my opinion. There's other schools of thought. Uh, for example, I, I won't name any, but you can look up. There's um, major venture capital firms that take a different approach, and they've actually written about this topic. Um, and, and I think a summary of the stance is that, um, you know, it, uh, if you give people up to 10 years to decide if they want to buy their equity, that equity doesn't come back into the option pool. It doesn't get allocated to the people who actually stay, right? And so some people believe it's, it's unfriendly to the people who actually want to stay for the long run to take that that kind of policy where you give people a long time to choose whether to buy their equity. Um, so I think, uh, you know, a way to summarize that is uh, the trends are, are changing, but it's not uniform. But this is just one other way that startups now have to compete against each other for talent, right? If you think about, um, you know, I'm a startup and I want to attack somebody to my company, there's various ways you can do it. You can do it with money, with title, uh, with responsibilities, but also with all of these ancillary things. Is it a remote job or is it in person? You know, uh, how many perks do I get? And and now all these things like, um, you know, how long do I get to exercise my equity after I after I leave the company? So it's um, hopefully that gives you a perspective, which is that some things are changing, but not every company has adopted these changes. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks, Sanjay. Yeah. Cool. And then do you have time for maybe one, just one more, Sanjay? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so I'm, I can go ahead with the remote work question, but if anyone has something else they would like to ask as the final question, um, we can do that too. No? Okay. So I um, would love to just get, get, get your thoughts, you know, post pandemic, post COVID, a lot of companies are in this weird hybrid situation. People are going in once or twice a week or entirely remote. And I think the answer probably does depend on your level of seniority and the company stage. But I am, I think a lot of us would be interested to hear your thoughts as a, as like a engineering leader, leadership level. How do you think about remote work? Totally. Uh, and I'll just uh, obviously say the, the disclaimer that this is my personal opinion, not necessarily my company's opinion. Um, I think that, um, I think that remote is awesome for employees. Like as an employee, it gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, I think it comes with some drawbacks for the company overall, like in, in terms of productivity and collaboration. Um, I will say this, I will say, just like I just said in this previous answer, it's another axis upon which people can compete for talent. And so we have hired some, amazing, amazing engineers that there's no way we would have hired if we were um, only open to roles in the San Francisco Bay Area. Like there's no chance. And so um, I think the benefit for a company like Acasa is that uh, it broadens the talent pool and it's really helped us land some of our best talent. Um, I think just my personal opinion on the drawbacks 
uh, is that there are a few. One is that uh, unless you try hard, it can be hard to have accountability, right? So in an office, you kind of know what people are doing. Um, you know, there's almost some positive peer pressure to work hard, right? You know, if you show up to the office at, at noon or, you know, leave at 3 p.m., everybody's going to see it. Um, but in remote, uh, some of that accountability can be missing. And so I think it requires more management skill um, to uh, to create that level of accountability. And so like all this stuff that people talk about on the internet of like quiet quitting or like people working two remote jobs at once or whatnot, like that stuff is terrible. You know, it's terrible for companies. I don't think there's any debate about it. And so I think managers have to be really on their game um, to manage effectively in a remote environment. But I think even even in the case where everyone is earnest and wants to do a good job, remote can still be hard because uh, a lot of information silos form. You know, people aren't running into each other at lunch or, you know, in random meetings or in the hallway. Um, and you'd be surprised how much information disseminates through those mechanisms. And as a result, um, people can start to feel like they're on an island in a remote company and you really have to make an effort to get people talking to each other, um, communicate what folks are doing on different teams. Um, and, and I think especially for junior folks, it can be hard to get the help that you need um, when you're remote. So that's my kind of uh, hopefully not too hot take, I would say balanced take is that I think it's really good for employees, for employers, uh, I think it gives access to a great talent pool, um, but I think that comes with some um, some maybe drawbacks or things that you have to be careful about in order to um, make the whole team be cohesive and work effectively together. Yeah, I, I, I actually really agree. Um, broadly speaking, I'm not a fan of remote work, and I think that if you're early in career or if your company is really, really small and just fast moving, or you don't have PMF, like you don't have private market fit, I, I think that you need to be working co-located in an office or having a lot of face time. So um, yes, I like the hot take and I like I, I definitely agree. Um, cool. So Sanjay, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I think it's so valuable for many engineers to have that interaction with someone of your level. So I dropped your LinkedIn once again in the Zoom chat and then I'll also direct people to the AMA thread on Taro. So, I mean, if you have time, Sanjay, I think it'd be amazing if you just go through there and um, look, reply to people if, if you mm -hmm. have the time. That way, sure. if people didn't have time to ask it here or they watch the recording, they can go back and still get feedback from you. Um, is there anything else you want to point people to or um, any last words of wisdom? No, I mean, thank you all for spending the time. I, I enjoyed all the questions. And yeah, if I can be helpful... Um, as Rahul said, find me on the internet. I might be uh, more responsive on, on Twitter than on LinkedIn, but you can try either one and um, just really appreciate the time and I hope it was helpful.